Welcome to the video, viewer. This here is the final part of The Eminence in Shadow Season 2. Check out the other parts if you miss them. I'm gonna go ahead and start talking for a bit now. When we last left off, it's snowy as heck. Sid hears about the state of the war-torn country he is in, then proceeds to contemplate his journey to become the Eminence in Shadow. Previously, when an event came up where he could vaguely resemble his imagining on what the Eminence in Shadow is, he would jump at the opportunity. But now, he feels that something is missing. These girls are Rose's Shadow Garden homies. Sid wistfully looks upward, where coincidentally, Rose is having an existential crisis in her underwear. She has delusions of her dead father, who, unlike in reality, hasn't forgiven her for murdering him. This dilapidated place must be the Oriana Kingdom. Rose regurts some stuff, then gets called into action. The triad of baleful babes are meeting up with number 559, a skilled fighter who won the right to challenge numbers. Rose has some kind of vague brain blast, but the audience doesn't learn anything. Later, they go to join 556 in the mission to investigate a small castle town, which was seized by the Cult of Diablos. Rose is peeved after peeping the aftermath from the senseless slaughter. 559 tells her that she chose Rose specifically because she was given power directly from Shadow, which is an anomalous thing only experienced by few. Her companions are shook. 559 reveals that she too was granted power from Shadow, then makes fun of Rose for being weak despite this. Her elitism is interrupted by movement on the roads. They track the caravan to the ruins of an amphitheater, finding elites of Diablos gathered around a relic. It is activated emanating a familiar ring of nonsense and encasing the card wielder in a rainbow dome. It's Rose's mother, much to the girl's surprise. She touches a triangle, deactivating the seal and revealing a veiny loop. 559 orders their immediate intervention to retrieve the ring, which she calls a key, then goes to conduct an execution. Rose gets in her way though, which is probably an ill-advised move. The cult is elated by the opportunity Rose handed them as she gets punched in the face. 559 continues her relentless assault, but there is a cutaway shot. Later, New reports to Gamma on the events from last night. Gamma reveals that their investigations were mostly intended to lure Mordred, the ninth seat of Rounds, who controls Oriana Kingdom from the shadows. This newspaper reads that Rose has returned to the kingdom, which has caused a massive revolt among the citizenry. Gamma decides to send in a large force and let Rose do whatever, trusting in the plans that Shadow has simmering behind the scenes. Sid contemplates the romance of a kingdom divided and brainstorms ways to look cool using this as a catalyst for his eminence in shadow gig. He accidentally flirts with the innkeep while thinking out loud, then decides that since Rose had the resolve to kill her father, then she must want to be some kind of tyrannical monarch. As a supporter of the dramatic, this reason alone causes him to muster the determination to help Rose become the next ruler of the Oriana kingdom. He accidentally flirts again, then suddenly, some thugs barge in to collect mafia money. Sid goes back to his roots as a side character by pathetically defending the innkeep. She is inspired by his courage. Oh, snap, crackle, pop. We know this lady. She was that prostitute he saved in the lawless city a while back. They part ways as Sid contemplates being outshined by his past self. Sid spends the next few days becoming a prisoner, breaking out, joining the army, getting beat up, juicing some old guys who proceeded to become legends, and now Sid wanders the streets aimlessly. He stumbles upon the thugs from earlier, discussing an enormous treasure hiding in some ruins. They fall to Sid's unwavering avarice a few moments later. The innkeep laments her lack of funds while fondling herself a sack a money sack. Shadow was here. 559 slaughters the cult of Diablos' his entire elite squadron, except this guy, who is a little more resilient. It's Batman. No, it's Shadow. 559 goes totally feral with Shadow's purple juice and obliterates her foe. She recites poetry amidst the blood rain. 559 tries to snitch on Rose, who stole the important ring and betrayed Shadow Garden. Shadow doesn't even know who number 666 is, and ignores everything while the women quarrel in the background. A paper announcing Rose Rope's betrothal to Perv Asshat flutters auspiciously into his hands. He goes super sane, causing a misunderstanding with the girls, who think he is going to slay number 666. He's actually just confused about where the plot is going. Lambda brings the short bus of new reinforcements to the city and asks about Rose. She takes it upon herself to render judgment on her betrayal to atone for failing to train her properly. Unfortunately, her resolve is crushed, as Lord Shadow has undertaken this endeavor first. No power or authority can cease 
his warpath now. The girls mourn for number 666's impending demise. Epsilon bounces onto the scene to assist Sid. Her cover as a talented classical pianist allows her to walk freely throughout the Oriana Kingdom, meaning that Sid may also stroll freely as her number one student. She breasts boobily alongside him. Sid reflects on her excessive effort. Perv enters the scene, eager to hear the music which Epsilon can bring to their troubled kingdom. Unfortunately, Rose will not be able to attend, as she is feeling unwell. Epiphone introduces Sid, who is informed that he is illegally trespassing. Perv says his intrusion is fine, as long as he plays a jaunty tune for them. So he does. Every one of the attendees are smitten with Sid's chill vibe. He takes this opportunity to rob them with his slimy powers. Perv attempts to sate his curiosity, but is deflected by Epsilon's ardent defense. Sid notices Perv's special pouch with his x-ray vision. Enhance. Yoink. Score. Sid decides to wander around, but can't catch a break because a maid named Margaret caught feelings for him after hearing his sounds. She's persistent, Rose is assigned caretaker, as well as some other things. Epsilon is obliterated by the hard truth of the matter. They go for a stroll through the castle while discussing his future as a musician. Margaret is overbearing in her onslaught of assistance. Sid mentions Rose, incurring her dissatisfaction. No one likes the princess because in a culture of artists, she became a warrior, committed patriotism side and plunged the kingdom into darkness. Despite Rose's location being a national secret, Marge blabs while in a euphoric daze. Sid skedaddles after believing that she intends to proselytize him. However, his escape is cut short after encountering a particularly aggressive guard. He tries to defend his completely one-sided love for Meg Muffin, the maid. Sid escapes while his aggressor rambles in a euphoric daze. Meanwhile, Rose laments her tragic circumstances. Sid scampers up into her room, receiving the troubled princess into his arms. They speak dramatically about her arranged marriage. Of course, both of them have completely different ideas on what they're actually talking about. Rose thinks Sid wants to marry her, while Sid believes that she wants to be a horrible tyrant queen. Their dialogue runs impressively perpendicular to their thoughts on the situation. Rose begs Sid to forget her and focus on his own happiness. Later, Perv catches hands, but doesn't want none of that. The queen applies makeup in her underwear. Sid eavesdrops on their conversation, finding that Rose's mother is being held hostage to use his blackmail for her marriage to Perv. He figures the ring he pocketed was meant to be the wedding ring, but this moment is for foreshadowing instead. Epsilon and 559 converse via jiggling. They discuss the mysteries surrounding Rose, 559's failing, Shadow's presence, and his current movements. Epsilon reports that the legendary ring, Black Rose, was once used to wipe out an army of a hundred thousand soldiers overnight, and that she fears if Shadow Garden makes too many abrupt moves, then the entire kingdom will be obliterated along with them. Sid interrupts by casually entering the room. He is immediately catered to while reporting on the progress of his mission. 559 is enamored. Mordred has a FaceTime with Perv to discuss their inevitable acquisition of Oriana Kingdom and Pervy's ascendance to the Order of Rounds. Little does he know that the box he carries contains no treasures. The queen and Perv are having some kind of seedy affair, probably. Somewhere in a ravine, Shadow Garden infiltrates a cult hideout, but don't know what they're looking for. Sid contemplates freeing the queen to resolve the situation when he is molested by Margaret, who got her stalker fired. She attempts to sequester Sid from Epsilon, but fails. They verbally eviscerate each other, while he expertly flees the situation by playing piano in the nude. Later, Epsilon tells Sid about Black Rose, which gives him wartime flashbacks. He finds it interesting and wishes to see a black rose, like the flower. They misunderstand each other some more, and Sid goes to rescue the queen. Perv and her are swapping their sauce in secret, though. Sid is disappointed by this outcome, and ideates on how to correct the plot. He figures selling Rose would do the trick. Margaret is peeved. Rose is a good girl. She feels the tinge of a light breeze, which beckons her to the window. Lord Shadow has already entered, though. Number 666 assumes he came to kill her, and proceeds to apologize, seemingly accepting of her death. Shadow requests that she follow him to bear witness to the truth. And, well, uh, this here is the truth. Rose can't handle it and makes an impromptu porridge. Shadow recites inspirational poetry, but accidentally incapacitates her. It's a little bit awkward now, so he apologizes. Back in her room, Rose awakens, then proceeds to twitch in a resentful furor while shedding numerous tears. She desperately wishes to return to peaceful days at the academy. As the request leaves her lips, the melancholic rhapsody of Moonlight Sonata caresses her hovel of despair. Upon parting the shutters, she finds Sid 
performing on the balcony like some kind of perverse felon. Rose isn't surprised by this, probably because of her mental state, and implores that he elope with her. Sid ignores her pleas of desperation by conveying his philosophies to her via a metaphor, comparing Moonlight Sonata to his perspective of the world. He essentially instructs Rose to cast aside things that don't matter and focus on doing everything in her power to achieve her dreams with the time that she is given. Sid continues to monologue about how easy it is for people to forget what matters, which is why he appreciates the moon so much. In a world covered in darkness, the moon shines through just enough to see what is important, whereas in broad daylight, everything is visible, confusing the focus, or something like that probably. Sid does a bassy shadow voice, asking her what her primary objective is, then evaporates, leaving only Black Rose and a massive piano behind. Rose is inspired. Later, Sid is frustrated at losing the cool ring he pickpocketed, but satisfied with his operation to fix the plot. Epsilon and him bathe together. Sid admires that her boobies have been refined to perfection, and reports on his progress. Epsilon manages to somehow coincidentally figure out that Shadow gave Rose the ring. Sid continues his report by stating that Oriana Kingdom's problems will be solved on the day of the wedding. Three days later, the plebs have begun a civil protest, but are gunned down in the mean streets. Perv reflects on his quest so far by vividly hallucinating images of the previous king and the Black Rose, the Ring of Succession. To become the owner of the ring, he must secure his royal blood by marrying into the family. He eagerly waits to become one of Rounds, flipping open his little box of dreams to find it empty. Perv tries again, empty, and again, same. He has a small mental breakdown, then receives a Skype call from Lord Mordred, who wanted to tell Perv that his place in the twelfth seat of rounds is all warmed up for him. He ideates furiously, but the wedding continues. Rose enters the cathedral dramatically. Her mother is asleep. Duke Ashat twitches in panic. Sid is handling the music. As they reach the pinnacle of the ceremony, Rose declares that she will not be Perv's bride, denounces him, reveals his evil schemes, then whips out the black rose. She declares her love for Sid, putting on the ring he gave her. Black Rose stutters a bit, then projects King Girk's TikTok apology video to the entire world. His visage goes on to reveal the entire truth of his passing. The peerage begins to murmur, as King Girk declares Rose to be the kingdom's next ruler. Perv goes feral, but is beheaded by Rose. His dome rolls lifelessly to the queen, who is also beheaded. Not by Rose, though. Mordred is here, and angry. He introduces himself, and opens what he calls a door, by using this fidget toy in the Ring of Power. A laser fire into the sky, summoning the power of the Black Rose. Sid goes nuts on the pipe organ, as Mordred calls forth the Archfiend, Ragnarok. Oriana is blasted up. Ragnarok poses for dramatic effect, then Shadow takes over by dismembering the cyberpunk dragon. Rose and Mordred are shook. Shadow recites poetry in response. New reports on the activation of Black Rose to Alpha. She doesn't mind though, because Shadow is taking care of things. Ragnarok makes a bunch of bebes while Shadow introduces himself and his girls. He tells Rose to go, and with a grin, sets his sights on the dragon. They get the business. Mordred is approached by Beta and Epsilon. He doesn't wait around, and attacks with his ancient elvish weapon. It doesn't work. The girls verbally rip his fit to shreds for being borrowed power, then counterattack with their own strength. Mordred is shook, believing that they're in possession of artifacts as well. He's wrong, though. Rose witnesses the desolation of her kingdom and its people while defending what pieces she can. The palace is cleared out, and, as queen, she delegates Margaret to handle an evacuation to the royal garden's cellar. Meanwhile, Shadow thinks Ragnarok is a large bat, scolds it for being predictable, then deploys his magical ropes. Rose inspires a couple of ninjas or something, then contemplates Mordred, who is more dead at the moment. Beta berates him for relying on artifacts, but he isn't willing to listen. She then doubles down on their goal of extracting knowledge of Black Rose, the magical beasts, and the cult. He confidently tells them all about it, after reassuring himself that Ragnarok is invincible. Mordred imparts his sagely wisdom about dimensional teleportation to them, explaining that there are a bunch of worlds rotating around probably God in an nth dimensional space. Some planets have powerful beasts just asking to be brought over to their world. He goes on to say that sometimes these worlds collide and magic power sloshes hither and thither, sometimes bringing things through, like humans for example. Mordred figures that humans are aliens who migrated to this world from some other place. He uses a historical fact that an entire island kingdom up and pieced out once to prove his point. Anyway, Black Rose is a gate to one of those other worlds, which was accidentally opened in the past, which led to a mass 
massive slaughter of soldiers on both sides. History tells the story a little differently, but it was the cult of Diablos which closed the portal by using Royal's blood. And now, after Rose's father declined to offer some of that good magic juice in homage, the cult went ahead and opened the gate back up. Rose defends her father's love for her, but Mordred isn't having any of that. Raggy's arm makes a surprise appearance. It's Shadow, and his overwhelming atomic power. Mordred is shook. 559 reports that all the beasts have been dealt with. Mordred loses his sanity slightly, and stuffs his face into Ragnarok's arm, metamorphosing into a spider pervert. 559 is elated. Shadow punches Morbid a few times, dodges his lasers, then flings him into space. After dramatically reciting poems into the dark abyss, he thanks Mordred for helping him be imminent and shadowy, then obliterates him in a gratuitously intricate recreation of an atomic bomb. It's extra impressive this time. You can tell because all the characters get some screen time to reflect on how bright it is outside. Shadow hovers above the ruins of Oriana when suddenly a worm's hole appears. It exposes its green circle, which is delicately poked by Shadow, and he's gone. Back in modern Japan, it's a bit of a mess now. Nishino, the girl from the first episode of season 1, makes an appearance. She goes to rescue her friends from some unknown terror while reflecting on the guy she hated in high school five years ago. Looking at the moon always reminds her of him for some reason, and Nishino finds her friends have been slain already. She is alone. Then approached suddenly by someone who I think resembles the soldier Sid fought off to save Nishino. His cyberpunk henchman helps to recreate the start of the anime. That crazy soldier has a traumatic flashback and goes nuts. Unfortunately for him, his flashback turns into reality and the stylish thug slayer introduces himself. They have a rematch, but Shadow is stronger. He introduces himself as Shadow and that's the end of season 2 of The Eminence in Shadow. Hey, you enjoyed the video? Like comment, subscribe. If my succulent tones have seduced you, maybe consider donating to my Patreon. Thanks to those who have done so already. Uh, bye.